Well, good afternoon again, family, um, and welcome. Uh, please stand for the reading of God's Word today. We continue in Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 2, verses 25 through 49, as you're able, and you join me as we uh, go over this together. This is, of course, our fourth week of Daniel so far in our series on Daniel. So please join me. The Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, No wise man, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed, came thoughts of what would be after this, and he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than any other than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the might, and the glory, and into whose hand he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. Another kingdom, inferior to you, shall rise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron, that crushes it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with soft clay. And as the toes of the feet are partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage but they will not hold together, just as the iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and his interpretation sure. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel, and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts, and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request of the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel remained at the court. This is the word of the Lord. So last Lord's Day, we began this story of King Nebuchadnezzar's terrible dream. You may recall a couple things about it. First, we remember that King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, uh, was early in his time as king. It was only his second year of his reign. Probably very unproven as a king. Probably feeling very worried about that and concerned about the fact that he is not proven. And as we said last week, many kings don't survive their first few years as kings. They're taken out by assassins or plots or political machinations. Um, so he had a, a, a dream then this time that added great stress to him. Um, and you can see from the dream why it might have created great stress for him. Uh, so he assembled his counselors last week, all the people who were supposed to inter interpret this dream, whose job it was. In fact, they had manuals, dream interpretation manuals they would use to interpret dreams. Um, but they, he, had an, uh, he had a different idea. He didn't tell them the dream. He said, I want you to tell me what the dream was and what it meant. They, of course, rightly respond that no man could possibly do this. And they partially write the response that, well, only the gods could do this, but they don't dwell amongst them. Of course, as we saw last week, uh, the gods, little, little, little g, can't do it, but our God can. Moreover, he does indeed dwell amongst us because he sent his son to dwell amongst us. And in fact, his spirit lives within us. And someday we will live with him in his kingdom on earth here, truly living with him. Um, so they were partially right, given partial credit for this. So even their pagan uh, minds had some of the truth there, that man indeed could not do this. So the king was not happy with this answer. He sent out his captain of the guard, uh, which we said could also be translated as his chief executioner. So, you know, maybe it was the same job. And maybe that's why it was a common term for both. It was the guy who was captain of the guard, also killed the people the king wanted killed. So he sent the, uh, Arioch, his executioner, captain of the guard, uh, to have all these wise men executed. He's like, you're no good to me if you can't tell me the future. You claim you can, you can't, you're all dead. Um, they get to Daniel and his friends, who, as we remember, were training uh, as these wise men, they were in training still, uh, so they had not heard what's going on. They're like, what's going on? Daniel, being very wise, asked Arioch, who was coming to kill him, hey, what's going on? What's the stress? Why is the king so worried? What, what's, what's the deal? Right? Um, of course, uh, Arioch says, okay, uh, this is what's going on, and Daniel's like, okay, well, how about this? You hold off on killing us, you go tell the king that Set up a time for me, I'll come by, and the Lord will tell him exactly what he wants to know. All right, so great confidence Daniel had in the Lord, right? So he set an appointment. Right? Then he gathered his friends, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as we saw this week, whose Hebrew names I always forget, so I'm not even going to try, but they're beautiful Hebrew. Um, he gathered them together for a prayer meeting, right? Uh, and then they began to pray. And almost immediately as they're praying, the dream and its interpretation was given to Daniel. And it was, we saw how fast this was last week. It was boom, 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 boom. Thing after thing after thing, no repetition. Just all of it going through, followed by Daniel. As soon as he gets this message of what, what the, the interpretation of the dream was and the dream itself, he stops and praises the Lord. And we get a whole four verses of what we call Daniel's psalm. Basically a song of praise that he immediately lifts up in prayer to the Lord. Then he goes to see the king. That's where we left off last time. So... As of last time, we don't know the interpretation. We don't even know the dream yet. We just know that Daniel had great faith in the Lord and showed up. Now, some things we also learned last week is we said our God is the God of the impossible, and he's always on his throne. Our sufferings and trials are never meaningless. But in fact, our response in times of trial, like Daniel's, is what distinguishes us from most of the rest of the world. It's what people see in us that makes them say, what is it about these Christians and their response to this great tragedy that has led to them being so different. What is it that they have, right? It is a witness to the world. Now, one more thing we mentioned last week is that starting in chapter 2, verse 2, and going all the way in Daniel 2, chapter, into chapter 7, it's written um, in Aramaic, right? Which uh, is unique. Most of the Old Testament is not in Aramaic. Very little of the, of the Bible is in Aramaic. But Daniel, chapter 2, 2, verse through the end of 7, in Aramaic. Why? Well, we, we establish, or at least we, we presume, that it's because it is meant to be a message, a gospel to the rest of the world. It is for the rest of the world to read because Aramaic was the language that was most common in the ancient world this time, the language that most people would be able to read. When it reached the most people, especially the most important people as well, Aramaic was the language you wrote it in. So, so we have this twist 
where they begin speaking Aramaic and the rest of the chapter is in Aramaic after that, all to the end of, of the chapter 7. Um, because Daniel's trials that we read and that, that we can, are preserved for us today, that the Jewish people at the time were able to read, were also made available to the rest of the world to read as a, a witness uh, to both his people and the rest of the world, that his God does miracles. So just a beautiful picture there of the language change, implying that this is a witness, a gospel, not just for us, but for them. Also, we learned that to respond rightly, we need God's true wisdom, not man's false wisdom. We talked about the difference between God's wisdom and man's wisdom in the past, right? The, pag the pagan world has um, empty, hollow wisdom, right? Our God's true wisdom is found, though, in his scripture. And so uh, our takeaway really was scripture is where we go for God's wisdom. That is his word incarnate in Christ given to us uh, to guide our lives. Amen. So finally, unlike the pagan gods, our God is real and indeed dwells among us. First in the incarnation, and as we already said, then through the indwelling Holy Spirit, and then someday um, his kingdom will be on earth and we will truly dwell with him and reign with him according to scripture, right? So We'll see more on that shortly, because that's a large part of what this interpretation is about. So this week, as we saw, the story continues, picking up in verse 25. So the dream. First thing we see is that Arioch, uh is quick to take credit for Daniel. Did you catch that? He's just like, oh, this guy came to me. He's like, I found this guy, and he has the interpretation for you. Now, did he find Daniel, really? No, right? Daniel, I mean, he goes to kill Daniel, so I guess in that sense he kind of found him. I, I found this guy I was about to kill, and he's like, wait, I have interpretation for you. I mean, if you count that as finding someone, I suppose, but really he didn't. He was very quick to take uh, credit for this good thing, and that maybe says something about the court of King Nebuchadnezzar. It says something about a lot of courts and a lot of uh, governments throughout history that people tend to take credit for the things that go well, and if it goes poorly, they just blame the people below them, right? That, that is a very common thing history. That is our sin nature at work. So likely he would have also been quick to pass on bad things. Now you'd imagine what would happen if Daniel had come in and be like, I'm kidding, I don't really know it. He'd be like, oh, it's all Daniel's fault, and it's this guy below him's fault, and it's everyone else's fault, but not my fault. I was just doing what he told me to do, King. Um, so nevertheless, he comes in, and he takes credit for finding Daniel, and then the king asks Daniel the obvious question. Okay, Daniel, no, you have interpretation. What is the dream? And Daniel responds, so it's a contrast to Arioch. His response is exactly the opposite. He responds in humility. He doesn't take any credit. Right? He didn't say, like, you know, I had the wisdom. He could even be like, I had the wisdom to go to my God about this. He didn't take that. He's like, no, my God gave me the answer. No man can do this. Your, your pagan guys, they're right. No man can do this. But God, there is a God in heaven who can. In fact, he, he gave me the, the, the dream and its interpretation. It's all the glory of God. Um, and again, so he reiterates this idea that the, no man could do this. This humility, by the way, I'm going to point out, is very Christ-like. This is an example of Daniel being very Christ-like. Um, and I, I'd say you can look at Philippians 2, 5 through 8, where we see that Christ is the ultimate expression of humility, that having his mind among, have this mind among yourself, says Paul in Philippians, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself to become obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This true example of humility Christ set, being God incarnate, but not counting it as something, um, in, is actually, we see a lot of this in Daniel here. What a, what a great, again, prototype of who Christ is going to be. As we saw before, like, like we always say, Christ is the true and better David. You know, he's the same for Daniel. He's a true and better Daniel. Daniel was a very good man, right? but he was not Christ. We admire Daniel in as much as we admire that he followed who Christ was going to be, right? He followed his Lord the same way we follow Christ. Uh, so in Daniel's response, we get our second glimpse here of what the dream was about. We begin to see hints of it again in his, his first response here. So because we saw in the psalm last week that he already hints at what the dream is about. The psalm is all about how God, you are the God who sets up kings and tears down kingdoms and and all of these things are in your hand, and you are the Lord of all, of all things. You give all power, and you take all power away. And so that was the psalm he wrote last week. This week, we see him already in this beginning passage, talking to the king, kind of hinting what's happening next, right? Um, the dream is a vision of the future, he says. It's about what comes after this. Very profound word, after this. Then, Daniel dives into the dream. Now, 
Saw the dream just now. There are two primary subjects uh, in this dream. Right? The first, subject one, a massive statue, they call it an image, which implies it's of a man. We get the implication clearly is also of it that it's got a head and arms and legs. Up. Um, so it's, it's of a man. A giant statue has a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, middle and thighs of bronze, and legs of iron with feet of iron and clay. This is, by the way, where we get the expression feet of clay. Fun there. Uh, second, so second subject is a stone, right? Cut by no human hands, struck, it strikes the st statue on its feet of iron and clay, and the statue shatters and is blown away like chaff. The stone becomes a great mountain then that fills the earth. And you can see why, without interpretation, King Nebuchadnezzar would be a little worried about this. I mean, is, he, is this his kingdom? Is this statue his kingdom? Is he the statue, right? Um, what is the stone? Is he the stone? Is some other kingdom the stone? What is happening? You can see why it's a very frightening thing to have seen this and not know what it means. Right? There's so many ways you could go with this, with this whole dream and its interpretation. So, rightly, he's worried. But God had the interpretation, because God gave him the dream. Continuing in, verse, uh, uh, in chapter 2, verse 36 through 30, 45, we see Daniel begin to give the interpretation. So, um, the parts of the statue, Daniel says, are kingdom. Okay? They're kingdom. The golden head is King Nebuchadnezzar, representing Babylon itself. Right, the very kingdom in which they are living. Uh, it is God, by the way, and I love this part here. We see him say that it is God who made Nebuchadnezzar king. It is God who gave him the kingdom, the power, the might, the glory, as this passage says, right? He gave him authority, and I love this interesting picture of authority that, that King Nebuchadnezzar is given. He's given authority over mankind, over beasts of the air, over birds of the heavens. This, by the way, notice is a similarity here about God's delegation of authority it's, it kind of points us back to the Genesis account, where Adam is created and given the domination over the world. And this is saying, these things are yours to rule. You know, the, the, the birds of the air, all of creation, the, the, the animals of the ground, all this is yours to rule, as he tells Adam, right? So we see that when God gives authority, he gives authority, right? He delegates. But in the end, it's his to give. It's his authority delegated. More on this shortly. So what wonders what King Nebuchadnezzar thought of this idea that his authority was from God, by the way? We don't get an answer here yet. Um, I mean, he praises the Lord in the end, right? But we have to wonder, we can't get his head a little bit, what is he thinking, right? He's thinking, I won this kingdom. My father won this kingdom. We fought hard and became rulers and took on more land and we conquered Judah. It is ours. And here we see them saying, no, God gave you all this. Not a single thing you have was not given to you by God. And he can take it away too. Because, and this is there's important two words, there is a time after you. Again, here is this King Nebuchadnezzar. We saw last week, by the way, that when his uh, advisors talked to him, they would say, oh, king, may you live forever. And we kind of joke that, well, he's not a king. No, one, no king here on earth will live forever. And in fact, the very dream is about the fact that he won't live forever. There will be a time after him, right? And so we get this subsequent kingdoms. We get this silver arms and chests which is called an inferior kingdom, inferior kingdom. Then a bronze belly and thighs, kind of the middle and the thighs, which another king will come along, it'll rule over the earth. That's our only identifying feature of this third kingdom. It'll rule over the earth, right? So it is, it is implied, by the way, that each kingdom is possibly growing in power, influence, but decreasing in value. Interesting. As, you know, even back then, gold was very valuable, as was silver, as was bronze, useful in warfare, as was then iron, right? You have these pictures of things increasing in value, but increasing in strength. I um, mean, you made weapons, for example, out of, out of bronze, right? Greeks particularly did. So, what does it mean for this king to be inferior? We don't actually know exactly what is meant by the word inferior of the silver kingdom. Uh, in context, it might have to do with cohesion. That, that, you know, we see that the last kingdom is the least cohesive kingdom, so maybe they're getting progressively less cohesive as, as they gather more and more nations. Another thought is it could be argued has to do with power. You could say that in history, King Nebuchadnezzar was an absolute monarch. He had complete power in his kingdom. And no king after him in this series will see that so they had that kind of complete power over his subjects. Um, that's, uh, in fact, we'll see when we talk about Persians later that uh, if, you ever, if you remember the book uh, of Esther, 
right? Her husband was the Persian king. Uh, he, he had to like, he couldn't undo his own decrees. Like there was all kinds of restrictions on him, even as a king, things he couldn't, couldn't do, right? Nebuchadnezzar was a pretty absolute monarch in the end, which is interesting to know. Um, so again, this important pair of words of verse 39, the after you, uh, it would be, this would be pretty humbling to King Nebuchadnezzar, right? Uh, as we said, his advisor always said, may you live forever, but here he won't, right? There is a time after him. So these next two kingdoms will go over pretty quickly. They're just briefly touched on, as I said, the arms of silver, the, 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 the middle and, and thighs of bronze, and we get those one inferior, one will rule everything, and then we get to where most of our time is spent, the legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. Then he moves quickly on to this fourth kingdom. Right? And more time is spent here than anywhere else because that's where the action is going to happen. That's where the stone's going to come in and shatter things. Right? The fourth kingdom is of iron, but has a weakness. It is strong, but as I said, of less value than the kingdoms. It will nevertheless crush the other because of how strong it is. Right? Um, in fact, it'll, it'll crush kingdoms in general. It the, has the power of iron. Um, when we get to talk about who we think these kingdoms are, you'll see why it is a kingdom that crushed many kingdoms. It has, as we said, feet of clay and iron. And we know that clay and iron, I don't even know how you'd imagine them mixing together. They're not really the same substance, right? They're kind of, they don't marry well together. So it'll be strong but brittle. Um, it will be divided, right? It is lacking in coherence. It will not mix well. Uh, and it will not hold together in the end. It will, it'll fall apart. Um, note, by the way, that these feet are the foundation of the statue, right? What a poor foundation for this statue, this edifice, right? Um, if you break the feet, the whole statue is going to fall, and they're not very strong as feet, right? That's funny. I was uh, thinking about San Antonio, and my wife and I were talking about San Antonio and how um, we've been doing some yard work of late. And our house is on solid rock. Like just to dig down a few feet is a lot of work uh, because it's just so much rock, and our house is going nowhere. Right? But there are parts of San Antonio that aren't on the bedrock. We have a lot of limestone here, but there are parts where there's a fair amount of soil. And before they get, did a good job of engineering foundations, you'll find a lot of houses in San Antonio that have cracking and, and, and sinking, and maybe you have lived in a house that had a foundation problem. It's really common here, right? Now, they should be out of these days, engineer a foundation that doesn't do that. Modern houses should do that. But it's a funny thing, the, how, the, the, the place I work, um, the building I actually work in, is sinking. It actually is, uh, it's, <laughs> um, it was built in 1968. Uh, and even though I work for an engineering company, it was not well engineered, let's say. Uh, I mean, to be fair, I think the engineers at the company did engineering. We brought in people for that. Uh, and so it's sinking into the ground. It's the oldest part of the building. And in fact, we joke that it's slowly becoming a basement. And at some point, they're just going to build above us and wall us in. And, uh, you know, they'll find, you know, archaeologists will find engineers in there all you know, calcified in place, like still working at the computer, right? Um, <laughs> it'll be an interesting record of that, right? Um, but yeah, a foundation matters, right? If you, if you build on, a, on, a, on, a, on poor soil, it's not going to last. The thing above it's going to fall apart, right? And in fact, uh, my part of the building, by the way, is soon to be condemned. Uh, no joke, it actually kind of has already been condemned, but they're waiting to find a place to put us, so I'm still there. We're oh, indefinitely right now. So uh, if I, you ever hear about like, a, you know, sinkhole collapse in, in uh, San Antonio and check and see if it's me, I need help. So... <laughs> Uh, but again, as we said, the point of that is that a foundation upon you, which you build matters. A strong foundation, a solid rock upon which to build, uh, is critical to the structure that builds on top of it. Right? Uh, if you build on stone, it will be unshaken. So, we've seen four kingdoms now, but then comes a fifth kingdom. Not part of the statue, but separate. The stone, other objects. Right? So what does Daniel say about it? Um, We've seen these four earthly kingdoms that represent fittingly a statue of man, right? These are manly kingdoms made by men, right? By man's effort, right? But this kingdom that's coming, it is not cut by human hand. Man has no part in it in the sense that they don't make this kingdom. The kingdom is made and shaped, Daniel will say, by God. It's God's kingdom. It'll be set up by God. Um, it will be eternal. Future again. It's an eternal kingdom. It will not be conquered. It won't pass from hand to hand like these other kingdoms. Because we see a, a, in this hierarchy of kingdoms, we'll see as well with the history a little bit, a subsequent conquering of nation after nation after nation, each one conquering the last. This one will destroy all the rest and nothing will come after it. There will be no and after for the kingdom of God that is coming. It will never be conquered. It will destroy all that came before it. 
In the end, Daniel assures the king that all of this is certain to come to pass. Okay? What an interesting thing, that this is certain to come to pass, that the Lord, the, the living God, gave you this vision of the future. Now, before we get to Nebuchadnezzar's response, which is interesting, let's take a moment to speculate a little bit. It's not much speculation, but let's, can we take it further? So Daniel gives an interpretation, and we'll get some lessons from that interpretation directly, without worrying too much about what the kingdoms were. There's a lot of things you can find in that. But, let's speculate. Which kingdoms are these? Now, most scholars, particularly conservative scholars, will hold that, well, clearly the head is Babylon. We're told that. Kidding. Babylon is the head. We're, that's just the answer given to it. The crib sheet on that one, we know the answer, right? Um, but who is the silver? Well, most scholars associate the silver with what's called the Medo Persian Empire. Now, why these two names, right? The Medo Persian Empire, uh, also called the Medes and the Persians, right? They conquered Babylon, by the way in 539 BC, during Daniel's lifetime. Enough. So Daniel will be there for when they're conquering. And in fact, as we'll see as we move through Daniel, he will continue to be an advisor to the kings of the Persians and the Medes. Right? He'll, he'll continue to be an advisor in these courts. They'll see his value and keep him around. Right? Um, so in all that, they conquer, during Daniel's lifetime, uh, the Medo persian Empire conquers the Babylonian Empire. Right? Uh, in, in under Cyrus II, the king of Persia, by the way, uh, they conquered, so why is this dual name thing, right? Why is it the Medes and the Persians? Why isn't it just the Persia or the Medes or, or Media, the country itself? Well, in 549 BC, uh, Cyrus II, king of Persia, conquered Media. Um, by the way, King Nebuchadnezzar would have been alive for this part. He would have actually seen the Persians conquer the Medes, his neighbors conquering each other. But interestingly enough, rather than absorbing the Medes as like, a, a, you know, rather than absorbing them entirely, they actually kind of allied with them is very interesting in history. The Persian king, Cyrus II, recognized the Medes had a really great administrative state. And so rather than taking over, he put them in charge. He said, yeah, now I conquered you, but now you're going to rule everything. In fact, your kings are going to still have a lot of power. They're still going to be uh, privileged and royal. They're just going to be under me, but they'll still be part of my kingdom. Um, this is such a truth that in history, we find that the Egyptians, um, the, many of the Jews at the time in their writings, the Greeks, all refer to the Medes and the Persians simply as the Medes. They consider the Persian Empire as an extension in history of the Median Empire um, because nothing really changed. They conquered and then became kind of one nation, and then although the Persian king was not above it, everything was still run by the Medes. They were really good at it, kind of what he put it, I guess you could say. So it's all connected to that same history. So they're treated as one kingdom. Now, some have argued and speculated that, well, that's why this part of the statue has two arms. It's the two kingdoms that are of equal value, and they're both working together. I think you're probably stretching the metaphor a little bit. Maybe that's true. But I don't think we have to stretch the metaphor like that. It's clearly the next kingdom that comes along and conquers them, the Medes, the Persians. Treated as one kingdom. Right? Um, yeah, there's no indication we're supposed to take additional meaning from this. I don't, I don't see anything that says, no, no, there's meaning here. There's meaning, and it's all pointed out to us. We know it's the, it's the, it's the levels and the types of metal you Now, by the way, a number of Daniel's prophecies and actually other prophecies from, from uh, Scripture refer to the Medes. Uh, they're referred to by Isaiah in Isaiah 13. Uh, Jeremiah mentions them by name as well in Jeremiah 25 as well as Jeremiah 51. He actually talks about both. He prophesies both that they will, as Isaiah does, that they will destroy Babylonians as a as a, basically a punishment for what they did to Judah. Right? They're going to be. They're going to be. And then they in, in turn will be punished by God. Um, it's kind of a funny thing. God sets up and does these things with kingdoms that He wants to do His will. He set the Babylonians to punish the Judah. Right? And take them to captivity for their, for their good in the long term. Right? But then he sets up again the Persians and the Medes to take them over. And then he'll take them up to be conquered as well. Right? Because each has sinned to be punished in this case. Right? And yet in the end, it's, it's building up the history that God has planned. There's a plan to history. Um, and again, we'll also see that as we go through the rest of Daniel, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 11 all make reference to both. We have the, Mede, the kings that he works with from the Medes and the Persians, and also some prophecies about what's going to happen to them. So, um, yeah. So, and of course, as we said, we'll see Darius the Mede is one of the kings that we see Daniel serving us. So there's a lot of connections. Right? So that gets us through Daniel's lifetime. But here's the question. Who's the bronze? The bronze stomach and thighs right, of the statue. I kind of hinted earlier about how bronze being associated with Greece. And so most people would say that Greece was the next, con the next nation that comes along. Greece conquers the Medes, the Persians, and of course the Babylonians as well, because they're all part of this one nation now. They conquer them. Um, and in fact, by the, under Alexander the Great, uh, who you may have heard of, Alexander the Great, 
right? Yeah, he's pretty great, they say. Uh, he conquered the known world. So you talk about this picture given here in Scripture of this bronze portion of the statue who be king that conquers the world. Well, the Greeks did. They conquered the known world under Alexander the Great. His kingdom, by the way, went from southern Europe across the Middle East all the way to India. That's how big the kingdom of the Greeks was under Alexander the Great. Now, interesting enough about this, by the way, it, it led to their language spreading across the world and becoming, as we said last week, the lingua franca of the world. It was the, the Koine Greek is the language of the New Testament because the world spoke Greek at the time of Christ, right? And that happens because the Greeks conquered the world, right? So even when the Romans come in soon after, they don't change the language of the world. Um, the language of the world at this point becomes Koine Greek, Greek right? Um, so they conquered the Medes and the Persians in 331 BC. The, the Alexander the Great conquers them. And then, but here's interesting enough, after Alexander's death, the Greek nation fragment doesn't last. Talk about this idea that the East nations successing this is less strong in a way, and less cohesive than the one before it. Well, they don't last. Uh, it's split into four kingdoms. All of which are still Greek, all consider themselves Greek, uh, but you have his four generals who kind of split the kingdom up amongst themselves. Um, and that leads you to all kinds of history. The Ptolemaic Empire in, in Egypt, if you're interested, that kind of stuff. Some great history here. Uh, Judah, by the way, itself is taken by one of these nations, uh, and it's under Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, Antiochus IV. Um, anyway, a lot of history there, interesting stuff. Uh, they actually do, if you know the time of the Maccabees, which happens in that silent era between the end of the Old Testament and the end of the New Testament, uh, the Maccabees come along and they actually take back Judah from the Greeks and the Anti Antiochus. They have a very brief period of freedom. And then our fourth nation comes in, the Romans, and conquers it all over again. Um, so the Romans conquered Judah, by the way, in 63 BC. So their short period of freedom um, after the return from Babylon and under the Persians, after their conquering by the Greeks, after the brief moment of, of freedom, after they kick out Antiochus Epiphanes and his people, right under the Maccabees, they are immediately, soon after, conquered in 63 BC, right before the coming of Christ by the Romans. Right? Uh, so uh, this is uh, a time we get to our fourth part, the iron legs and the feet of iron mixed with clay. They are therefore Rome. No one's surprised at that. Yeah, it's probably Rome. Yeah. Um, they're the most powerful nation on the list, by the way. Uh, the strength of iron is mentioned as how powerful they are. They lasted over half a millennia. 500 years the Roman Empire lasts. Right? That's a pretty long time for an empire of man to ever last, right? truly. I mean, you can say we have ancient cultures that go back a long ways, but if you look at those cultures, the cultures have lasted, but the kingdoms have not. Like, there are very few kingdoms that actually trace their history back that far that haven't been replaced by one coup or another, by one conquering or another. And yes, we still have parts of the original nations, but they're whole different structures, whole different governments have taken over, right? But the Rome lasts 500 years. Um, in the end, of course, we know that Rome will fall, right? Uh, we get a hint of it here. Rome's not going to last, right? Because no nation. Second here, no nation of earth last, right? Um, it said, by the way, at the end of its time, uh, the Roman army uh, was made up primarily of conquered Germanic peoples. So the very army they were using to conquer the world was made up of people they conquered, uh, all of who were serving for the chance of, of citizenship in, for, in Rome, right? And we get to a point where your nation is primarily made up when all your armies are made up by people you've conquered and not by your own citizens, it's usually a bad sign in the long term. It's one of the five or six reasons that Rome fell, likely, the fragmentation of it. And we see very specifically that Rome will be fragmented, by the way, into these very, very distinct kingdoms, right, at some point. There'll be the, the ruler in Constantinople and the, the ruler in, um, in Rome. That'll fall first, actually. So we have a lot of history there. I'm not going to go into all that right now. But it, it's good stuff. If you like history, it's some fun stuff to get into. Um, but again, one of the reasons Rome will fall, one of those many reasons, is because it's made up of very fragmented people. Tried to absorb all these peoples, and many of them didn't actually absorb into Roman culture, right? And so they don't last. But that's after the time of Christ. So, so what of the stone? Stone now. Well, a little speculation needed here. We're told what the stone is. Stone is Christ, right? It's the Messiah who will come and his kingdom that will come and replace and crush all the kings that came before it, right? And it will come, notice, in the time of the fourth kingdom, the fourth kingdom of Rome. When was Christ born? In Rome. In the time of, in the time of, not in Rome. In the time of the Romans ruling over Judah, right? Um, it is the exact time and place that, right, that the Lord predicted for Christ to come. 
Uh, and by the way, it's the perfect time. It was set aside as a time because we see some things that have happened because of the Roman conquest. We had the Pax Romana, if you remember the term Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. Because they had conquered so much and, and then built roads to all of it, travel was possible more than ever before in history. People could travel anywhere with relative safety in, in the empire of Rome, right? The Pax Romana ruled, right, in the time of Christ. And we, we already said this common language, right? The Romans continued to spread the Greek language at this point. Even though they had, their, Latin was the language of many Roman people, um, the language of the, of the empire was Greek. And it still continued to be spread. So in the time that Christ came, there was no better time in history, a time where the message of the gospel could spread in a language everyone understood to the widest possible audience. So nothing happens by chance. God has planned all of this out. So we can look actually and say, so how do we know that Christ was a stone? Well, I mean, apart from being kind of obvious maybe, but we can say, okay, what does Luke 20 have to say about this? Verse 17. But he looked directly at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush them. Now, most people would recognize right away that uh, Jesus quotes Psalm 118, verse 22, at the beginning portion of that, where he's talking to these Pharisees and Sadducees, saying, Hey, don't you know what the scripture says about this? And he talks about the stone, right? But then he, he goes off course from Psalm 118 and refers most clearly, we believe, to this passage in Daniel. The stone that will crush, and anyone who falls on it will be crushed, right? And when it falls on it will be crushed, and when he crushes, it will crush these people, right? He is saying here, by the way, and by the way, the Pharisees understand this. He's saying, I am the Messiah, I am the stone, right? We know they understand it because they want to kill him immediately in that scripture. Like, oh, they wanted to kill him, but they were afraid of the crowds. They don't do it. But they immediately want to kill him because they know what he's saying. He's saying the stone that was talked about, the one you recognize as the Messiah that's coming, I am that Messiah. Um, so, now notice that his kingdom, though, unlike the other kingdoms, these kingdoms that have come before have been established through conquering, 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 gathering of power. But the kingdom of our Lord actually comes through rejection, sacrifice, death. Right? The stone the builders rejected, that becomes the cornerstone, right? Um, these earthly kingdoms, like I said, all conquered, by, all conquered each other and were establishing conquering, but not, none of them will last. Yes, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Um, by the way, this scripture where Christ is talking uh, to the Pharisees is actually right at the end of what's the parable of the tenants. Remember the story of the parable of the tenants in the vineyard? Where this uh, basically have this um, a vineyard owner who sets up a vineyard and leaves some tenants there to take care of it. And when he sends off, to, hey, can I get the, the fruits of the labor of the vineyard that I own? They beat everyone he sends to them, right? And in the end, he sends his son. Oh, surely they won't beat my son. And then they beat the son. They kill the son, thinking then they'll be ours. There'll be no inheritor, so we'll inherit this, you know, this vineyard. It'll be ours now, right? And of course, their punishment is to be destroyed. And that's where Christ comes and says, this stone will destroy them. Those the evil tenants, right? And of course, the picture is, as Christ says, clearly, um, all the prophets that were sent to the people of Israel, and how they punished and they, they beat and they rejected all the prophets Christ, the, the Lord sent. So in the end, Christ comes, the Son of God, who they kill. kill. So again, Christ associates himself with this stone. So we know from Christ's mouth himself, the stone of Daniel, Christ, his kingdom. Acts 4.11, we see that Jesus is the stone that was rejected uh, by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And here Peter refers back to what Jesus had said already. So this is Peter talking in Acts. He refers back to Christ's own comment about him being the cornerstone, right? And he's talking to the council, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, um, the uh, scribes at this point, kind of before the council being Told, stop preaching this gospel, and he's like, the stone you rejected is the cornerstone. He said it himself. I'm not going to stop preaching the gospel. Uh, Luke 1.33, we see, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom, will, there will be no end. Um, here again, we see the angel talking to Mary, and she's like, why me? Why are you picking me to be the, the, the mother of the, of the Messiah, of the Christ, right? And, and the angel is describing what Christ is going to be like, and that his kingdom will reign forever. So we have, again, this peer pointing back to there is a kingdom coming, a kingdom that is made of the stone that will not end, eternal. There are so many other parallels here. Um, we could get into example, uh, the stone establishes a kingdom that starts out small and then grows into a mountain. So stone becomes a mountain. You may recall Christ uh, telling a parable of a mustard seed, how the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed that will start off so small. And Matthew 13 talks about this and then grow to a massive tree that the birds can perch in. That, that's how the kingdom of God is going to be, right? Um, we see 1 Peter 2 talk about how uh, the Lord is building a, uh, a, a basically a, a, a 
dwelling place, a building of living stones, his church, right? Stones again used. And we have this idea that the foundation of this stone, the cornerstone, and the work of the apostles is the base of this, of this church that's being built by the Lord, right? Um, and that this stone, this foundation that's been built, and the, and the building on top of it, the church, will keep growing until the end of the age, until his kingdom is established. That same picture there of a small thing becoming this massive thing that fills the earth. That's our promise from the Lord, that his kingdom is coming, and it's not going to be small when it comes, even though it does start off small. Right? The mustard planet. So, and finally, we see here that the kingdom is not fashioned by human hands. That's just a clear thing. We see that Christ, Son of the living God, came, not fashioned by human hands, made, but, but all of this, you know, his kingdom would be made by his own hands, right? Um, again, so, and finally, we see that the rock smashes a kingdom, that the feet, the time of the Romans, and everything before it goes away like chaff. It's interesting about that. Do you, know, do you know how chaff is handled? Picture you may have heard before. But the way it works, it, farmers in the old times would take um, the grain, right? They'd winnowed. And they would try to get the chaff out of it, which was like all the little bits of, of um, sheathing and stuff on it, right? And they would do is they go to a very high place. They'd lay down a big cloth or tarp. And they would take the grain and they'd throw it in the air, right? And the heavy grain would fall into the tarp and the chaff would float away. It'd be lost forever. Wind, about a high, windy place. And that's how you handled it. Um, Random aside, that's not so different from how we actually uh, separated uranium back in the Manhattan Project. That's a separate story. They actually used the mass of uranium. They shot out of a gun, basically, and it hit a, a metallic a wall. And the stuff that fell was the heavier, denser stuff they wanted. And the stuff that didn't wasn't. That's how they slowly purified uranium. Random aside. Um, but I just thought of that. It's funny in history how gravity is so useful sometimes. Um, I'm glad we have it, by the way. Otherwise, we'd all kind of blow it off. That'd be bad. So, um, so here's, having said all that, so we've identified the kingdom. We said, okay, we believe with a fair amount of confidence that the kingdoms were Babylon, the Medes, the Persians, um, the Greeks, and then the Romans, right? We think it's a pretty good parallel. But does it matter who the kingdoms are? I mean, it matters a little, I think. I think it matters because we have a God we know can be trusted over history. We know that he had a plan for history. He set it out before it happened. Um, but by the way, talk about the Medes and the Persians. There's actually times in Scripture uh, where Jer uh, Isaiah calls out by name some of the kings of Persia before they are born, by hundreds of years. So much of the scholars who don't believe in true miracles in Scripture struggle with how to date those parts of Scripture. They're like, well, how could he possibly know? So much changes later. But we have evidence from internal Scripture stuff that they were written when he said they were written, right? We have these kinds of amazing evidence in Scripture that, that God, our God, has laid down history. None of it's a surprise to him. But there, even, even if we don't know who the kingdoms are, let's ignore for a moment who the kingdoms are. There are still lessons we can take uh, from who these four nations are, or from the story of the four nations, the statue, right? Uh, first, there is a philosophy of history here, as we said. History is the Lord's. He brings about what he intends, when he intends it. So, um, what's more important than what happens, or when things happen, is that they happen, as he says they will, right? Uh, scripture has promises that about our future, by the way, that we can rely upon. He says the Lord returns. We can trust in that, right? It's going to happen, because he says so. Second thing we can get from this is that the source of all earthly authority is God. You see right there that God gives each earthly a kingdom um, its own its power and glory. He gives it to them. They don't gain it themselves. He gives it to them, right? And as we saw, the creation language that was used for Adam was also used for Nezer, right? The dominion over all these things, right? God sets up and tears down the kingdoms for his own purposes. Thirdly, notice the transient nature of worldly authority Every one of these worldly kingdoms has an after this and after this, right? Only God's kingdom will last. There is no after this for God's kingdom, right? Fourth, there's an image of what is called the cycle of nations here. See the cycle of nations, that nations rise up and fall, right? Um, not only do all on earth the nations eventually fall, but they are worth less in many ways as they get further and further from God's initial establishment, right? Um, we can say this actually as a prototype of this is in Genesis, right? In the Genesis account, we see that in Genesis 1 and 2 that Adam is created and given authority as an earthly authority, right? He's set up as the first ruler, if you will, because he's given dominion over creation, right? Um, but he falls, right? And then we see this leads us to the flood, 
from the judgment of the flood in, in verses six through, uh, chapter 6 through 9 of Genesis. And then there is this moment of disunity and dissolution. The kingdom of such a man fall apart at Tower of Babel, right? And in Genesis 11. So we have the same picture established by God, losing value over time because it's a manly kingdom, not following God's precepts. And over time, eventually it fractures and falls apart by God's hand at the Tower of Babel. It was God who fractures the people, right? And then God steps in with his godly kingdom. That story ends with the establishment of Abram as the kind of precursor to God's chosen people, saying, hey, in this long sequence, here is hope. Here is a kingdom of God. Now, this is a type. We talk about types and antitype, shadows and substance, right? This is the type of God's kingdom. It is not God's kingdom. It is the type of God's kingdom. It's pointing us ahead as we read the Old Testament toward this thing will happen. In fact, its full fulfillment, its final fulfillment will be in God's kingdom that will come after all earthly nations are destroyed. And when it comes, they will destroy all nations. Um, yeah, so this is a pattern of the, of, the, of the true kingdom established by Christ. The end of history is not a statue of a man. It's our final lesson we get from this, right? The end of all history is not a statue of a man. It is not a kingdom set up by man. The end of history is not anything that man can establish. In fact, it's not even improved statue of a man. You know, the humanist impulse that, that things get better over time, that we can improve things, um, is not true in the end. We see that over time we degrade in, in, in many ways. Yes, technological marvels exist. We've done so much in these ways. But as people, we degrade over time because we get further and further from God's establishment. And as much as the kingdom of the Lord comes in already, we see it's already established through Christ, right? And it's that, we talk about that now, later, you know, kind of tension between uh, that we're, Christ is already established, but also his kingdom is coming, right? In that, so much as kingdoms ally themselves with God's plan, they do prosper. We see great advance. That's what through the history of Christendom is all about in many ways, right? Um, yeah, remember the Tower of Babel itself was, was really the first great human endeavor, right? But built by man's hands, but it failed utterly because man cannot work his way to God. No matter how much he tries, how much effort he puts in, man cannot work his way to God, but God therefore reaches down man. That's what he did. Praise God. So, before we get to some discussion of how we apply this and conclusions on this, what is the king's response? Our last passage, right? So verses 46 through 49, we get back to King Nebuchadnezzar, how he responds. Now, um, as we see, he responds in praise. He praises God, and he kind of praises Daniel a little bit here too, right? Um, which, you know, eh, if you hear, but, he, but he, that's, King Nebuchadnezzar is a pagan. He doesn't know any better, right? Um, it is unlikely, by the way, some people say, well, look, he became a believer, Okay, probably not yet. Now, I will argue that by the end of his life, and we'll get there later, that King Nebuchadnezzar, I think we'll meet him in heaven someday. If you read his statement later, after he, um, there's a, spoiler alert for the book of Daniel, um, and there's a point where, where King Nebuchadnezzar makes a big mistake, he takes all the glory upon himself, and God strikes him down and makes him like an animal for seven years. Like, a, like an animal of the, of the fields, eating grass and, and with, without a mind. And then someday, he, he finally recovers that after seven years as promised, looks up and then praises the Lord, and his praise to the Lord is an incredible, incredible praise. I think personally, and I can't prove this, that someday we'll see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven, that he was chosen by the Lord, um, and we see it in his praise. But here, I don't think he's there yet. I think he's, he's doing his best. He's impressed by what Daniel has done. Um, he's probably adding Daniel's God to his, his pantheon, one more God at the pantheon to, to regularly pray to. Um, but it's a start, right? And he's a pagan man, so this is a good start. Um, but Daniel also is given the reward promised by King He promised a reward to whoever could do this. He said, if you can't do this, I'm going to kill you all. But if you do it, I'll give you great rewards. Really, you know, two-sided there. Pretty extremes, right? Um, so he gives him rule over the province of Babylon. Now, they have a kingdom. Babylon is one of the promises of the greater kingdom of Babylon, right? And at Daniel's request, he does the same thing for his friends. Remember last week, they had a prayer meeting. They got together, they prayed together. And so Daniel's like, hey, I wasn't alone in this. We prayed together. God gave me the answer, but my friends and I, we prayed together. They reserve reward as well. And, so Daniel, and, and the king's like, yeah, okay, sure. So they are given a rule over parts of Babylonia as well. Um, this is, by the way, why next week, uh, or sorry, in a few weeks, I think John's doing something different for Easter plan. But when we get back to Daniel in a few weeks, um, we will actually see that uh, Rack, Shack, and Benny here. Meshach and Amanda go, if you prefer. Sorry, Veggie Tales again. I can't help myself. Um, they, uh, 
they are not with Daniel anymore. They're off in their own thing in another part of the kingdom. This is kind of what, what causes that. They are, they are off in another part of the kingdom, ruling a part of Babylonia, and because of that, they have their own trial they go through. Uh, Daniel is elsewhere during that time. Daniel, though, we are told, stays at the court with the king, and why wouldn't the king want him around? Not a useful guy to have around, right? So, conclusions and applications. What can we draw from all of this? What conclusions can we draw? Well, like last week, and like, like most weeks, the last three questions about the text. First, what would Daniel's uh, contemporaries and other ancient Israelites get from this passage? This was, of course, written to them originally. This was a message for the Israelites at the time, and, of course, the kingdoms around them, as we said, written Aramaic, right? What would they get from this? Second, how does that then apply to us? How we apply that message to us? And finally, where is Christ in this? Where do we see Christ? Some of that we've already gotten to quite clearly, but let's go back to it. So first, for the people of Israel, right? Last week we saw how critical it was that they um, understood that the Babylonian gods might have seemed impressive. We talked about last week's idea that, you know, in the ancient world it was common to believe, well, your kingdom captured our kingdom, your king conquered our king, therefore your gods are better than our gods. That's just a natural outgrowth of the human wisdom, not God's wisdom. There's no equation in there that says, but our God is punishing us through you, right? Our God is real, your God didn't exist. And our God is actually discipling and, and, and taking us and helping us grow through the, through the hard times we're going through by being a conquered nation, right? And that's what he's done for Judah. We, we, their problem is exactly that, that he has plans for them. And that this thing seems so terrible, but in the long term, it's going to refine them, right? And make them, um, then trials refine us, right? And their response to those trials is, a, as we said, a gospel to the world, right? So, uh, so we saw last week it's important that they understood that the Babylonian gods, despite the fact that it seemed like they were so powerful and impressive, were worthless. They had no power. They couldn't even tell what the king's dream was. They couldn't truly interpret it if they knew it, right? This week, though, we see a promise that the kingdom of God and the Messiah is coming, right? We see one of the many messianic uh, prophecies pointing to the coming of Christ. They even get this really reassuring timeline, by the way. I love that they get a timeline, right? Um, the kingdom of God will not come as soon as Babylon falls. Many of them are probably praying for the end of Babylon. Like, it just, you know, this is what we call the, the, the heresy of the if only. If only Babylon would fall, everything would be better. We see this under, under the, in actually the time of Christ. If only Rome would fall, we would all be in a better place. We'd finally be able to worship the one. We'd get rid of the Romans. Yeah. If only Messiah comes, he'll kick out the Romans. That's not where Christ came, though, right? But they were misunderstanding that. Um, so it is not, by the way, to rob them of hope, but instead instill what's called, what we call a realistic hope, right? It will be a long historical road before the kingdom of God comes, but it will come, right? They are not promised, like I said. Right? Um, now, we mentioned today being Palm Sunday, right? It is this very messianic hope, by the way, that led to the people of Judah um, throwing those palm trees, palm fronds on the road before the, their coming king, when Christ entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. They, this is a messianic fervor that had been built over a few hundred years at this point, I guess 600 some odd years from the time of, of Daniel to the time of Christ, right? It had been building and building, knowing, hey, we saw the signs. This is the kingdom. The, the messianic, Messiah has to come. This is the Iron Kingdom. It must be the case he's coming. He's going to destroy the Romans. You see how they read it that way, right? And so, in, in, in this fervor, they're laying down their palm fronds. They're, they're praising the Lord that here comes the Messiah, all right? Um, unfortunately, it was a temporal, nationalistic hope that they were, that they were leaning on, right? This idea, again, that if only Rome was gone and our Messiah is going to do that, we'll finally be free to have our kingdom on this earth, right? Um, it was not the true hope that Jesus offered, which is why within a week they turn on him. He's offering a kingdom at this point, not of this world. Only Jesus offers true hope. And in fact, that's the hope that we lay upon now, that we lean upon for his return, that his promise will come, that we, we know is coming. This is a shadow of the substance of Christ. His kingdom indeed is coming. Right? And it will be eternal. So, in the meantime, what are they to do? This message to the Israelites. What do they do in this time? People of Judah in captivity, well, seek the welfare of their, of their temporary home, right? 
We saw this in Jeremiah 29 last week. We'll read again in a second here. But um, they were placed in a fading kingdom, and they were waiting for a final kingdom. But while they're in the fading kingdom, they are to do their best for it, right? Uh, this is definitely what we see Daniel and his friends doing. They, don't, they, you know, they have themselves established as heads of parts of this nation. so They can do the best they can for those in it, right? For their fellow uh, people from Judah, fellow, fellow Jewish people, as well as for others, right? And we see they, they clearly reign and rule and advise wisely because Daniel's kept on <laughs> conquering after conquering, leader after leader. He's still there, right? They see a lot in him in that. So uh, they do the best for the, all the people that are under their authority, both Jew and Gentile alike. So how does this apply to us today, right? Um, so again, let's not forget the cycle of nations is our first thought on this, right? The pattern of human history is not of progress, but regress, right? The further the nation drifts from God's truth, the further it falls. And in the end, though, all earthly nations eventually fall. Um, this should not destroy our optimism, by the way, like, like the hope that the Jewish people have. It does not destroy our optimism. It is our it should destroy only our empty optimism rooted in a belief in the triumph of man. Right? Man will not triumph. God triumphs. True optimism is rightly placed in God's kingdom, not in our own. Truly, unless Christ returns first, even our nation someday will fall. Because no human nation can survive. That's the lesson of the cycle of nations. right? But regardless of if our nation falls, the church will be Triumphant. And it has been through history up to this point. As nations have come and gone and risen and fall, the church has been triumphant. It has grown and spread and it has not stopped despite all the falling nations around it. So we love our nation, but we don't put our trust. We trust in the Lord, right? Second, we should realize we have nothing to fear, right? Um, we don't need to be afraid of any earthly political power, no matter how strong it appears. Because it is fleeting, right? Uh, only there, it's only there at God's allowance and his provision. Remember, actually, remember Christ before Pilate, right? In, in John 19, 11, what does Christ say? Jesus answers him when Pilate talks to him, right? You would have no authority over me at all unless it would have been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Christ here is speaking straight to Pilate, the ruler of that part of the world, and saying, hey, the authority you have is the only authority that was given to you in the end by God, right? We have no fear of any earthly authority in the end because our God is greater. He sets up and tears down nations and kings and rulers, right? They have nothing to fear. Thirdly, let's remember that the king, that God's kingdom has already been established through Christ. It's already established, right? That now and later, that already not yet tension, right? And he will come back to finish establishing it. Um, uh, this is that again, as I said many times, already not yet tension. But we can know with some assurance um, that we can know with the same assurance that the Jews had that their Messiah was coming, that ours is coming back. Right? They knew their Messiah was coming. We know ours is coming back. Right? The Messiah will return because he promises he will. The stone has already been thrown. It's already crushed the nations of the world. Right? And it will grow into a mountain and establish God's kingdom on the earth when Christ returns. But like the Israelites, we can know that God is in control of history. Uh, and we'll establish everything in its right time. We don't know the time, but we know the history, and we know where it's going. Um, the fourth, personal caution, a sidebar here a little bit. Do we need to be cataloging, interpreting our dreams, looking for time? Let's talk about this for just a second here. Uh, Mario pointed out to me that there was uh, some heretical church that had a um, dream conference, like uh, come and learn how to interpret your dreams and see what God's talking to you about. And all I can think was, God gave you scripture. You know what he's talking to you about. It's in scripture. You don't need to catalog your dreams. Now, um, we know what the future holds for us because Christ returned and he's established kingdom on the earth. It's in scripture. This is given to us. The canon of scripture is closed. We we'll have to go to other sources to find truth. Truth is in scripture, right? Can I say, though, categorically that God will never give you a dream that reveals some truth about himself in modern times? I can't say it categorically. I can't say that it'll never happen. He's God. He does what he wants. As we saw in history. Um, I don't think it's normative, though. That's the word I use. I don't think it's a normative thing for God to give someone dreams all the, all the time that somehow the future. Um, I mean, in fact, we know what to do if someone does. If, if, if we do get a dream that seems to be from the Lord, we know how to test it, right? Uh, 1 John 4 1 it says you should always evaluate such dreams and test all spirits. Don't just trust them, right? 
divide them versus Scripture. What does Scripture say, right? Um, Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says, you know, yeah, don't despise prophecies, but test everything and hold fast to what is good. What do you test it with? Scripture, right? Um, in the end, though, I think I'll agree with Pastor Mike, where, and I'm paraphrasing this quote, and I believe he was actually quoting someone else, but I don't know who that was, but he said before, if the message you received is in line with scriptures, it is unnecessary and redundant, right? If it's not, it's heresy. So either it's unnecessary or it's wrong. So I'm not too concerned with us cataloging our dreams and concerned that the Lord's going to talk to us that way, right? Um, either way, side caution, just worth pointing out. Because again, we talked about whole passages about, you know, Nebuchadnezzar had a true dream from the Lord and God did this amazing thing. Well, it was also witness. Like it established scripture. That's part of how the scripture was established. And the scripture was established, right? But it is closed, right? We talked about that, that foundation before the apostles. That's actually that foundation of the apostles. They, the miracles they did, the, the visions that were given is what created for us the New Testament that is now closed. Because the apostles are gone, right? Um, we are now disciples. Finally, though, in all of this, our last question, where is Christ? Well, clearly, he's the stone that crushed the nation. He is the mountain that it grows into. His kingdom and he are the mountain that grows into. Unlike the weak clay and iron of the last kingdom, he is the cornerstone of the true and perfect foundation, right? Um, his, his church established that foundation can never fail. And as we saw, through history, despite the fact that nations will fall, his church will be triumphant over and over again, right? Um, like a San Antonio home built on bedrock, it's not going to fail, right? Uh, so what do we do? How do we apply this? What do we do until his kingdom turns? Finishes establishing on his return, right? Well, don't let our anticipation of Christ's return take our focus from seeking to serve our present community, right? Jeremiah's admonition, as we said before, the people of Judah in their time of exile in, in Jeremiah 29, 5 through 7, says this Build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on his behalf that on, on, in its welfare you will find your welfare. Be like Daniel and his friends. Um, don't be, as we say, uh, well, so the Christian walk is just this. It is a balance between looking forward to Christ's return but then doing good in the world today, right? And not over one over the other in the end because they have to be in balance, Right? Um, there's, a, there's a phrase people use about not being so heavily minded in the earthly thing. You've probably heard this before. Remember the Johnny Cash song that says that? I didn't know that. I was looking it up and it came up. And Marielle pointed out to me, yeah, it's a Johnny Cash song. Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, but uh, other people have said it as well. But, but just to have mentioned, I thought that was funny that Johnny Cash's song that mentions that. So um, be like many of our great heroes of our faith, people like William Wilberforce, right? And John Newton, right? Who worked together to end slavery, right? They, they, they had a heart for the kingdom of the Lord that was coming but they didn't stop affecting the world they lived in, fighting for those who were being oppressed, right? Um, you know, you have people like uh, 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 George Mueller, I remember telling him, George Mueller, someone who, right, who took care of children in orphanages, established orphanages, take care of them, highly depend upon the Lord, right? All of that while still looking forward to the kingdom to return, not knowing what day it would happen, right? Christianity is about keeping these two things in balance, right? So here's a question you can ask yourself. To kind of evaluate where you're at with this, right? If I were gone, would anyone other than my family be affected? If I were to be gone today, would the world around me notice, or would it only be my family, my friends? Which, of course, they would know, right? If our church were gone, right, would anyone other than the members of it be affected? Or would anyone notice our lament, our loss or of our church, our people, right? We need to be affecting the world around us in such a way that, that we would be a loss if it were to happen to that the people around us would be impacted by our disappearance, right? Um, what earthly use are we? On the other hand, though, don't be so busy pursuing programs of called earthly transformation, right? In, in the sense of saying that, you know, that they're based on human effort, that we lose sight of our heavenly goal, right? Don't spend your time polishing the statue that's going to be destroyed, right? Um, this world is not our home. We are indeed exiles here. We are aliens here. Strangers in a strange land, as uh, Abram was described when he goes into the promised land at first, right? Seeking to, seeking to transform culture can become an idol, right? If it takes our eyes off the God who provides the power to transform. But as, as, as Christ says, there are 
um, tasks set before us to do, do those tasks. We are in this world for a purpose. If we didn't have a purpose, we wouldn't be here anymore, right? When the Lord is done with us, he'll take us out. Until then, we are here for a reason, so be here for that reason, right? In the meantime, while we wait, we worship, right? Let's never lose sight that our primary goal in the end is the worship of the Lord. Even King Nebuchadnezzar did this. Even King Nebuchadnezzar did this, right? He praised the Lord. Didn't forget the whole thing. Didn't know it's in the whole picture yet, but he already is ready to praise the God who gave him answers, right? Our God reigns. Those who oppose him, he will shatter. Those who trust in him by his power will reign for him forever, reign with him forever. As we say, hallelujah, amen, come soon, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful that indeed you are the true God, the God of the impossible, the God whose kingdom has been established already and is growing, Lord. And someday you will come back, Jesus, you will come back and establish a kingdom on this earth. In the meantime, I pray that we as a body of believers, we as a church, would indeed be earthly good to those around us. Um, Lord, filling the call you've had on each of us, you have on each of us here in this world where we are, as strangers in a strange land. Trusting you and knowing, Lord, that your plans for us are bigger than our plans for ourselves, and knowing that you control history, you control nations, you give and take power. And all of this, Lord, we trust in you. We praise you. All we pray in Jesus.